91 verse 2 it says he is my refuge and fortress my god in him will i trust i have proved this verse in my life in recent years and i pray that as you hear how god answered prayer for me you too will praise and glorify him how God saved me that he will be glorified Psalm 91 verse 2 it says he is my refuge and fortress my God in him will I trust I have proved this verse in my life in recent years and I pray that as you hear how God answered prayer for me you too will praise and glorify him Well, folks, we are delighted to wel uh, welcome you to Cumber Free Presbyterian Church for our Tuesday night, our midweek uh, Bible study and prayer meeting. We're delighted to see you all, and we do appreciate your support. We do, really do mean that, and uh, we were for a long time without folks gathered in the house, and we are delighted to see you, and we warmly welcome those who have made the effort tonight to come, and we thank you for uh, being with us and we trust the Lord will bless you speak to your heart and even in the season of prayer that you'll be able to engage the throne if not audibly then silently and you will talk to the Lord tonight you'll bring matters to the Lord and we trust the Lord will give you victory and answer to your prayers and to those that are li listening through the various social media platforms we warmly welcome you in our Saviour's name uh, and we know there's an extensive congregation out there that are tuning in and the potential for many more as well just to tune in for the first time and um, we've had some communication from uh, last Lord's Day until now from various parts of the province and also uh, United States of America so whoever's tuning in and wherever you are we thank you for your support and we pray that Lord will richly bless you as you join with us for our Bible study and we will uh, be cutting uh, the uh, service short for our internet listeners as you would appreciate because we get down to our personal and private seasons of prayer here in the house so please stay with us at least for uh, the first part of the meeting and for the ministry of the word of the Lord. We're going to worship together. We're thinking of the Easter season and uh, we're going to sing. It may not be a, a well-known hymn uh, for Easter time, but it's in the uh, section, the resurrection, ascension and exaltation 
of Christ. I know that my Redeemer lives, what joy the blessed assurance gives. He lives, he lives, who once was dead. He lives, my everlasting head. Now, we know it is what is known as long meter, so we could sing quite a number of tunes to this, but uh, we're going for perhaps a well-known one. It's what we would sing uh, the Psalm 100 to, the old 100th tune. And uh, but like the doxology, so if you could keep that in mind and listen to the introduction, and we'll stand after the key as we worship. One, two, seven for those using the hymn book at home. <clears throat> That's good singing. Do you appreciate that? And he lives, he lives, he lives within my heart. We're tempted to sing one, two, three, but we'll keep it maybe for the Lord's Day and get you to hang on to some of those high notes. I remember whenever Dr. Campbell was leading this uh, hymn, one, two, three, at the Easter time, uh, he always got, I always asked him to come and lead that hymn. He was brilliant at it. And then he, he, in the chorus, just, he got you to hold on to the note until you were blue in the face. You had no breath left. And then he put the hand down and that signal just to finish off the last word. But when you hear it sung like that and you hang on to those last words in the chorus, it's, it makes for an anthem of praise to our God. And he lives. And that's the foundation of our Christian faith. The resurrection is the, the basis of all our doctrine. And Paul said that our faith is in vain. No matter what we believe about Jesus Christ, if we even say he's God and he's not risen from the dead, our faith is in vain. And we are, men and women, most miserable. Now, you wouldn't want to be most miserable uh, knowing all that. Paul says you're only most miserable if that was the case. But he lives, 
and we don't have to run to Jerusalem, although it'd be good for folks to travel there and see the Holy Land and those places in the Bible. But we don't need to go there. We don't need to look into some uh, sepulchre as Mary stooped down to look in to see if the body was there. We don't have to run like Peter and John to the tomb to see if he is there or not. But we believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is risen from the dead. And you'll not find his body, and you'll not find his bones upon planet Earth. He's in heaven, and he's physically there, the God-man, deity, and humanity, in one unique person, the mediator between God and men. And aren't you glad he lives? Because he lives, you too will live. And you'll live forevermore. And it's because God has accepted the sacrifice on our behalf and proof that that sacrifice satisfied all the legal requirements of divine law. God raised his son from the dead. Everything hinges on the resurrection. And God raised his son. I know that my redeemer lives. Let's bow in prayer. Loving Father, it is with joy and thanksgiving and praise that we enter into thy holy presence. We thank thee, Lord, for a real sense of thy presence through today, knowing that thou art with us. We thank thee, O God, for drawing near, and we rejoice in that. We think of those beautiful words penned in Holy Scripture in the book of James, where thou didst inspire thy servant to write, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to thee. And Lord, we thank thee that those words are true, that as we draw nigh tonight, we have the assurance. Lord, we, we take thee at thy word, the word of a gentleman. Lord, you cannot break your word. We come to thee. We draw nigh by faith to thee in Christ, in his righteousness, through his, Lord, work of atonement, through the mediator we come. And Lord, coming to thee, we draw nigh with full assurance of faith, believing that thou art and a rewarder of them that diligently seek thee. And as we draw nigh to thee, Lord, thou hast said it, and we hold thee to thy word, not that we need to, just for our own encouragement. We hold thee to thy word tonight, that thou wilt draw nigh to us. Lord, if there's one thing in this meeting house, in this prayer meeting, in Bible study, and in a season of waiting on God and seeking thy face that we need, we need the Lord to draw near. And we pray, Lord, you will come that you'll sit with us in the pew. And Lord, you'll stand with me in the pulpit. And I pray, O oh God, you'll walk up and down in the aisles of the church here, that you'll fill not only uh, the inner sanctuary, but the anterooms of thy house, and that we might, Lord, tread by faith the courts of heaven, that we will stand in thy presence, and when we come to thy word, sit at thy feet in submission to the word of God, to hear the word from thy mouth, receiving counsel and instruction that will do our own souls good, and having been fed ourselves, we'll be able to share it with someone else and give them a little morsel from the word. Enough, Lord, sufficient, even crumbs falling from the master's table would have been for sufficient for that a Canaanitish woman uh, whenever she said just the crumbs Lord but Lord we know that there's more than that for us there's a table spread in the presence of our enemies and Lord the dainties of the riches of thy grace are there before us and we pray you'll give us an appetite for the things of God a desire for the place of prayer and Lord just more than the desire give us the experience of a praying heart may it surprise us that words will flow apace Lord Lord when we come to complain as the hymn writer penned and we've often sung it in this house and elsewhere Lord's words seem to flow when we're complaining Lord we pray that as we're seeking thee Lord words will just come to mind words we never even thought of as Lord desires and burdens that we pour out before thee we pray Lord whether audibly or silently in the house tonight that there'll be a golden chain of intercession and we will have prayer in the Holy Ghost prayer that is heard in heaven and answered upon the earth prayer that truly changes matters and even changes me for things and we pray O oh God you will answer prayer and we pray you'll be with us tonight in the prayer meeting and you'll answer prayer in a remarkable way and you'll bless each head bowed we pray Lord for those at home those listening in through the world wide web we pray O oh God you'll bless them as well encourage their hearts and those who will receive the CD or the, the DVD or download the message or uh, Lord listen to it a little later on or some other point in time 
We pray, Lord, you will be pleased to make this night count for the good of thy people and the glory of thy thrice holy name. And we pray, O God, you will even speak to those who tune in, even to a, a prayer meeting and Bible study that are unconverted, and that even crumbs falling from the master's table spread for thy people tonight will be sufficient to bring some soul or souls to repentance and faith in Christ. Remember each home represented tonight. The need is vast. And Lord, who is there among us could know the need? And in, even if we did, if we knew it inside out better than anybody else in the world, who is there that can help? There's none but thee. And therefore we're in the right place tonight. We're coming to the right person. Through the mediator we're coming to thee, our heavenly Father. By the power of thy Holy Spirit, we're brought nigh to thee, and thou art nigh to us. Lord, let us feel thy presence. May we have such a stillness in our soul and minds tonight without a distraction, without any turmoil, without any anxiety, without anything else pulling at the heartstrings, demanding our attention, their voice vying for to be heard. We pray, O God, that we will, Lord, be still and know that thou art God, and we will worship thee. We will hear thee. We'll not see thee in the dramatic. Lord, we, we see so much today as if God's in the dramatic and they have to have the, the big meeting and the big crowd and, and they have to have the, the dance band and they have to have the, the guest singer from America coming over and a great praise night for somehow for God to be there. Lord, you're not in the dramatic. You're not in that which is, Lord, uh, loud. But Lord, we thought of Elijah and you weren't in the earthquake. You weren't in the dramatic you weren't, Lord, even in the wind as it blew. And, Lord, you could feel it and no doubt you could hear it. And, Lord, you certainly weren't in the fire. But, Lord, then came the small, still voice. And surely that's where we hear from thee. When we're still before thee. When there's no distraction. When the Lord comes down and speaks to our hearts and ministers the word to our soul. And, Lord, we need to hear from thee. We really do. Lord, it would be a tragedy to go even a day without ever hearing from thee through the word. Lord, we would have to confess our backsliding if we go one day without thee, just one day. Lord, we would have to confess self-sufficiency. We didn't need thee that day. We didn't need thy word. We didn't need to hear from thee. We didn't need thy presence. We didn't need thy hand upon us. We didn't need thee to guide us. Lord, we were, we were master of our own lives that day. Lord, what fools we would be. Lord, we're dependent on the Lord and we're drawing nigh because of that. And yet, Lord, we know that thou art with us. Make us to know and feel thy nearness. Lord, there's, there's got to be that deeper experience with thee for thy people. Lord, we, we just don't want what we would call the norm. We want, Lord, that up-to-date experience and relationship and fellowship with God and nothing in between. We long that our hearts would be knit together in love and harmony and everything that is grievous and offences in the body of Christ here, that thou will reveal it, Lord, and expose it and chasten us where necessary and drive it out like the money changers and the sellers of dove in thy house of prayer, that we may walk like thee in Solomon's court and worship thee and know the Lord with us. Let there be that purging, and cleansing and washing and that repentant spirit through the blood and may we have clean hands and a pure heart we pray lord for likeness to christ we pray for closeness to god we want to be known as those who walk with the lord we don't want to be known for gifts or talents or anything we achieve in this world seek not for thy word says great things for thyself but that we might walk with god think of the testimony enoch had that he, in his day, his generation, he walked with God. And we pray, Lord, you will give us a closer walk with thee, that we'll have, Lord, the sunshine of thy love and grace upon us and the blessing of heaven resting in our souls. So to this end, Father, prepare our hearts just now. Some have come from a busy day, no doubt. Some have come, O oh God, and just about got to the meeting, some leaving work, getting here. And Lord, you know all about that. Some may be not able to come. Lord, we're with them at home and bless them and do them good. But those who have made the effort, 
encourage them. There's nothing like being in the house of God in the presence of the Lord under the means of grace. There's something special about that. And we pray you'll encourage us tonight and you'll lift us up because of our risen Savior, one who loved us and gave himself for us at Calvary. May we fall in love with him again where necessary. And grant, O oh God, we will have that stillness within our own soul. Speak to us now, we pray. Just before we come to prayer and read thy word, we pray you'll bless and do us good. And Father, we will be very careful to give to thee, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all the praise, and we mean this, all of the glory, because thou and thou alone art worthy. And we ask these things with thanksgiving in Jesus' precious and most worthy name. Amen and amen. Let's turn in our Bibles to Mark's Gospel, chapter 5. About three weeks ago, I think it was, we were in this chapter, and I said I would return again and finish it. And the only opportunity we had was uh, tonight. So we're going to finish just looking at... Um, Jairus or Jarius, whatever you want to pronounce. I tried to learn how to pronounce his name, and then as soon as you do that, everybody else pronounces it differently than you've been doing it for the last 30 odd years, and then you get totally confused, and so it'll be interchangeable tonight. It'll be Jairus, it'll be Jarius, it'll be everything. And you'll say, that boy doesn't a clue. What's he doing in that pulpit? But uh, there are different pronunciations. I think we've got the right one when we say uh, Jairus. So we'll, we'll try and stick with that. So we're in Mark chapter 5 and verse 22. Let us all hear and read together the word of the Lord. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, Jarius by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come, lay thy, and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him, and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind, and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee? And sayest, who touched me? And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and seeth the tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel, and them that were with him, and entereth in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha kumai, which is being interpreted, damsel or little girl, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of twelve years, and they were astonished with a great 
astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it and commanded that something should be given her to eat. Amen. We'll end our reading at verse 43. We know the Lord will bless the reading from his own precious and infallible word. Father, do bless the word now as it's preached. I cry to thee, Lord, once again for the infilling of thy Holy Spirit with wisdom and power. I am trusting thee, Lord Jesus, for power. Thine alone shall never fail. The words which thou will give me now shall and they must prevail. Give me prevailing words. Bless me with the infilling of the Spirit that others may be blessed through the ministry of the Word. We offer prayer with thanksgiving in Jesus' precious and worthy name. Amen. Verse 36 really has formed the burden of my message last time, and I'm really just going to finish it. I preach one uh, point with just another two just to look at this evening. Uh, but verse 36 reminds us of those words of Christ, Be not afraid, only believe. Be not afraid, only believe. Uh, the last time we looked at this passage, we considered the desire uh, Jairus expressed and the reason for his desire was given in verse 23. We'll not rehearse it. But his only daughter, just 12 years of age, uh, was critically ill at home. And at the very point of death, in fact, death was leaving, uh, life was leaving her body. And when uh, Jairus had left home and had traveled to find the Lord Jesus Christ, he wasn't even sure if he'd make it home again. And uh, that was the case when the servants came to say that his daughter had passed away. So we see the reason for his desire. And that was his daughter wasn't well. He wasn't motivated by self, but the need of another, his daughter not being well. And then we think of the respect in his desire in the three Gospels, and it's recorded three times for us in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Gospel, the number of completions. So we have the complete record of actually what happened that day. But in Mark 5, 22, it says that Jairus fell at his feet. And in Matthew 9 and verse 18, it tells us that he worshipped him. And then in Luke 8, 4, 41, it says he besought him. And the words literally mean to beg of someone. Taking all of these acts together, we see a picture of an individual who's not only saved by grace for he worshipped him, but a humble, submissive, totally dependent servant of Christ who had a need and a burden he needed to bring to the Lord. And that's the best way for us to pray. This constitutes, I believe, a right attitude in prayer. And then we had the resolve in his desire. Uh, Mark 5, 23, we use those words, besought him greatly. And in the uh, margin of your Bible, perhaps, it might even say that he begged him earnestly. And being in what is known as the aorist tense, which is the continuous tense in the Greek, we don't have it in our English language, but you have it in the Greek. It's what is known as the aorist tense. And in other words, it's, it's continuous. There's no full stop. Just as if a person was begging and begging and begging. And you have every right to write those words in. He begged and begged and begged and begged the Lord until the Lord answered him. Uh, the margin reads, he begged him. It was a last desperate attempt to get his daughter help. The Lord, if the Lord did not hear his prayer, and then all was finished. That was the desperation he's shown. And then we have the result from his desire. Uh, we don't go to the end for the miracle, uh, but we have the result, the, the immediate effect of that prayer. The Bible says there in Mark 5, 24, and Jesus went with him. That was remarkable. Because he still had the problem, he still had the anxiety, he still had the worry. His daughter was still sick and he hadn't word, heard word at that time when Jesus went with him. So you can see the anticipation. He was at the master's feet. He was holding on to the Lord's feet. He was begging, beseeching, and he was crying unto the Lord, Please, Lord, come to my house. Lay your hand on my daughter, and she shall be made whole. And remember, there was a multitude thronging the Lord. And no doubt they were nearly trapping over the top because the word throng there means to be so pressed in so tight that you can't hardly breathe. That's what that word means, thronged. It means to be so pressed in. Not that you could actually move. You couldn't move, but you couldn't actually physically breathe. So tight was the multitude gathering around the Lord to see him perform miracles and to listen to his preaching. And even as that woman did, many wanted to touch his garment. If I could only touch 
him or touch the, the, the garment and the, the hem of his garment, then I'll be made whole. And we know that a woman sought to go through that throng to touch the garment of Christ and the hem of his very garment or his clothes for that matter. And the result was Jesus went with him. And we noticed last time that even though there may not be an immediate answer to prayer, we'll always have the Lord with us in our trouble. So moving on in the uh, passage, we want to consider two more vital points on uh, this prayer of Jairus and those words, uh, not to fear, but to only believe. You have not only, as I said to you uh, in this uh, passage, you don't not just have the desire that Jairus uh, expressed, but you have the delay that Jairus encountered. Now, there's little doubt whenever you read verse 23 that there was an urgency in the voice of this ruler of the synagogue. You notice in verse 23, and he besought him greatly, saying, and that word means saying over and over and over again. And here's the words, my little daughter lieth at the point of death over and over again. I pray thee, I know the words there are in italic, but to give the sense of the Greek, I beseech thee, I beg thee, I pray thee, Come, come, please lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she shall live. Now you remember on another occasion, the centurion came to the Lord and he only spoke the word. He only spoke the word. And even though the centurion uh, and uh, the problem was miles away, he spoke the word. And when the centurion went home and he asked at what hour was the child healed? And when they named the hour, he says, that's the very time the Lord spoke the word. Now, the Lord could have spoken the word to uh, Jairus and said, listen, go home. Your daughter has been healed. But he didn't. And I don't know why and have no answer to that. Why? But he started to go along with him to his house and he was intending to go to the house. I could suggest or imply from Scripture when we get to that point, the reason, maybe one of the reasons why the Lord certainly went with him and didn't speak the word on this occasion because I do believe in the case of the centurion, there was a greater faith because the Lord said, I quote, I have not seen so great Faith. No, not in all Israel. Not even among the Jews, and yet a Roman Gentile has greater faith. And therefore, that great faith got a, an immediate answer. I think in the case of Jairus, there was, uh, I, I believe, there was an element of unbelief because the Lord had to speak to him and say, Be not afraid. Only believe. Believe. So there was doubt. And that's why the Lord had to accompany this man, had to help him in his faith. That's why he didn't go to the centurion's house, because of his great faith. But on this occasion, that's what I suggest. I can't say that that is the reason, but I feel it's at least one of the reasons why the Lord actually had to go with Jairus to the house. And so I believe that there was an urgency in the voice of this man as he begged the Lord to come. And the delay... It would not have helped him. It would have agitated him. It's a bit like you ringing 999 for a loved one. And that loved one either has taken a stroke or a heart attack. That loved one and the paramedics working at them. And they say, look, we've just about got the heart started. If we don't get him to hospital, he's going to, to die. He's going to pass away or she, whatever. And all of a sudden, the ambulance arrives. And, and whenever the ambulance is in the driveway, someone parks a big lorry and the, the ambulance can't get out. And when you get the lorry moved, you find at the end of the road, two cars have crashed. And then you find as you go on to the road, there's, there's a diversion and there's roadworks and they have to divert all of these delays. You can, you can imagine being in the back of an ambulance with a loved one who's about perhaps to pass away and you see all of these delays. You'll become agitated. You would become frustrated. All this man could think of, remember this, all he could think of was a sick, dying young girl at home that he loved and had loved for 12 years. And he could only think of a distressed mother who most likely was sitting by her bedside holding her hand. And then he could think of the crowd that was gathered outside waiting on word. Is, her, is she okay? How is she now? Has she improved? Has, where, where's Jairus? Has he, has he not come back with word from the Messiah? Has Christ not come to heal this little girl? Has he no time for her? You can see just exactly what was happening in this scene and up to the actual 
miracle itself. In fact, all he was considering was, Lord, you can't waste time. Come, come. My little girl is at the point of death. Come, come to my house now, right now. Leave everything. Forget about this multitude. There's a greater need here. Come, Lord. And, and I want to say something to you. Things were looking good for a little season. For the Lord listened to Jairus. There's no doubt he, he got him back up on his feet. The tears were on his eyes. The, the dust, no doubt, was on his face. And he stood in the front of that multitude, shaking, trembling, having besought the Lord and poured out his heart. And the multitude had moved, but they had just moved along with Christ. They hadn't moved away. Because the Bible tells me that they were thronging him. But the Lord started and he attempted to walk with Jairus. And he attempted to walk in the direction of Jairus' house. And that's clear from scripture. For it says Jesus went with him. But he didn't get too far. Because things were looking good. He had listened to him. He had heard his request because no doubt there was a lot of shouting and screaming and no doubt there would have been words. Thou son of David, have mercy on us. Someone away at the back who couldn't get through. Thou son of David, remember me, my child. And they couldn't get through. The throng, the multitude had just crowded Christ out where he couldn't literally move and he could hardly breathe along with the disciples. Such was the press upon him. He even started to walk through the crowd toward Jairus' house. But then the turn of events stopped the Lord in his tracks. Uh, and I believe it delayed an answer to the prayer and the need of this man. I've no doubt that it caused him greater heartache and pain and anguish. Uh, we weren't there to witness it, but he may have been, been physically pushing the crowd away. Move, move, let him through. You don't know, but I just see a sense of urgency here. And the delay was caused, first of all, because of the crowd. In verse 24, that's exactly what it says. In verse 24 of Mark chapter 5, and we've tried to keep to this passage, although I tell you the truth, to get the great picture, you have those other portions of Scripture as well. And it tells us there in verse 24, And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. Thronged him. That means he couldn't physically move. He couldn't physically get out of that multitude. So thick and so strong it was that he couldn't get his way through. And you've got to remember, they were slowing down Christ's progress. And for uh, Jairus' little girl, time was of the essence. And this was an unnecessary interruption in the Lord getting to his house. It was an untimely delay. And no doubt it agitated the mind of Jairus. Such a problem would have caused him frustration. Why would the Lord allow such a de delay? He, he lifted me up more or less and I stood on my feet and he attempted to go with me toward the house and now the multitude, why is he not telling them to move? Why is he not commanding them to, to disperse? Let me through. Why? Why is he going at such a slow pace? Why, why will the multitude not move away? And you can see the desperation in this man. And he's prayed to the Lord. And now there is an untimely delay. It looks like his prayer is not going to be answered. Why? Does the Lord not realize the urgency of my case? Does he not know how I feel? Does he not feel and has he not heard the despair in my voice? But you know, God's timing is always perfect. The Lord could have spoken the word and that crowd would have dispersed. In fact, on one occasion, a crowd gathered round Christ and they tried to cast him over the edge of a cliff. And that was sat Satan and satanically inspired. They wanted Christ to have a premature death. He would miss the cross. He'd be killed by being thrown over the edge of a cliff. And the Bible tells us this, that Jesus walked through the midst of them. He just literally walked through them. I don't believe he used physical force, though there are times the Lord did use physical force in the right sense of the, the, the phrase, but it says he walked through the midst, right through them. And they stood there and he walked right past them. And yet on this occasion, 
He didn't exercise his power or his authority in his voice. He allowed the crowd to hold him back because he was teaching this man a lesson and waiting upon the Lord's timing. He didn't want to get there whenever the little girl was still alive because the crowd would have said, sure, she would have recovered anyway. Now, he had to wait until she passed away. Same as Lazarus. When he was told, he whom thou lovest is sick. Here's what scripture says. And he abode there two days more. And when Mary and Martha saw him, they said, Lord, if thou hadst been here, and maybe we're putting words in there, if thou hadst been here on time, when you were told, my brother would have lived. And that's what they said to the Lord. But the Lord is in control. He's in control of that crowd. He knew the situation and he deliberately delayed it. So don't be surprised if you don't get immediate answers to your prayers. And don't fall out with the Lord or get angry or agitated or frustrated. The Lord reminds us, doesn't he, in verse 36, the burden of the message centering on that little hook, hanging on that hook, be not afraid, only believe. There was not only the crowd, but then there was the woman, the woman with the issue of blood. Verses 25 through 27, we read it together there. Our Lord heard the prayer of Jairus. He assured him that he would come and heal his daughter. And he started to go with him. And then, if the crowd stopped him, then all of a sudden this woman, out of nowhere, touched his garment. The Lord stopped the whole proceedings and said, Who touched me? And then the disciples had a conversation with him. Remember, Jairus is standing in the midst saying, Lord, my little girl, my little girl. And the disciple says, Lord, who touched you? And, and if I wanted to paraphrase, they say, Lord, that's nonsensical. Sure, we're thronging you. How would anybody know? You couldn't know who touched you. Everybody's touched you. But there was a touch of faith. There was a touch of faith. And the Lord felt virtue, power, going out of him to heal. And he knew who it was, and he turned. And the woman came trembling. And then the Lord had a conversation with her. And then we have just the summary of it. We can't say for sure how long that conversation went. The Lord then said to her daughter, Go in peace, thy faith hath made thee whole. And if that wasn't enough, the crowd delaying it, then this woman, this, this what he felt was an untimely intervention. Oh, by the way, could I say to you, and I think it's a valid point, there was a, a vital issue, Jairus' daughter. And yet there was a single individual in need. And the Lord stopped. I believe that teaches us that the Lord cares about individuals. There's a multitude there. He's heading for Jairus' house and a woman is in need. And he stopped and he helped that individual. Christ has time for you. He's never too busy. You might say, well, the Lord's more interested in heading off to Jairus' house. He's more interested in a ruler of the synagogue than a, a poor woman who's had a, a plague that makes her unclean and she can't enter the temple and she's an outcast and she's no money now. She's spent it all. It's all gone. And she's a poor woman and nobody cares for her and her family don't want her. And she's tried everything. She's spent her all and, and she's still hemorrhaging. And that woman is an unclean woman. Put her away. She's like a leper uh, here in the, in the community and in the Commonwealth of Israel. She was never allowed to mix with the people because of her uncleanness according, according to the law in Leviticus and so on. She wasn't allowed into the temple to worship neither or to offer sacrifice. She was an outcast. She might as well have been a leper. And yet the Lord had time for her. I want to tell you the Lord cares for you. And, and another thing, Jairus' faith would have been encouraged because the Lord needed to encourage his faith. And to do so, the delay was, was good because he would see a demonstration of the power of God. Here's a woman and everybody knows about her. And they know about the plague she has and the money she has spent and those physicians that could never have helped her. And now it's an impossible case. And she only touched the Lord. Just touched him. And she was made whole of her plague. And there's no doubt that Jairus, standing there that day, saw that miracle. And he was taught a lesson in faith. 
Now, I don't have to rush to your house. There's no situation that I'm not in control of. And you need to learn, Jairus, that a delay is really my appointment. I want to teach you something. I care for individuals. And I can do all things. And I'm going to give you a demonstration of my power. I'm going to do it. And you'll witness it. And you'll have faith. Greater faith than you ever came to me with. You'll go away with stronger faith. And that's why this delay came. So God's delays are not that he hasn't heard or he doesn't care or he doesn't know or he's too busy. No. We showed you he's not too busy. In the busiest time when there's multitudes around him and he's a need over there in the, in the ruler of the synagogue's house, he stopped for that one lady. And that's all we have recorded in Scripture. We don't know because John says books could be written of the works he did. We don't know if there was another ten interruptions and he healed someone else or a leper or someone else uh, grabbed him by the feet and wouldn't let him go on. We don't know that, but we do know that John says that, uh, that this world couldn't contain the books that could be written. And that's not exaggeration, by the way, as some commentators tell us. Scripture does not allow for exaggeration or might be. It says that. And the works that Christ did from the beginning of creation till now, that's what it means. And no doubt in a few years of ministry, those three and a half years of public ministry on earth, uh, there was not only the crowd and not only this woman, but there was the message that delayed it as well. Notice in verse 35 exactly what is said there. And, and in many ways, I think even Jairus had just about given up by this stage. It says, While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why? Troublest thou the master any further? See, limiting of the Lord's power. Unless there's life, he can't do anything. Or he can do everything. But when there's death, it's impossible. He can't do anything now. Why, why do you trouble him? And if, if Jairus had believed that, he would have, he would have said to, to the Lord, Lord, thank you anyway. At least you made the effort. Only for that multitude. And that woman there. She's dead, so forget about it. I'm sorry I troubled you. I'll just go home and I'll bury my little girl. But thank you for, for your, your desire to come. You made the effort at least. No. And it was, it's very interesting, very interesting, that I feel it's the same remarks of Mary and Martha. Unbelief. Lord, if thou hadst been here, my daughter, my brother, had not died. As a zoo. We often limit the Lord by our unbelief. Why, Lord, the delay? She's dead now. If you had hurried up, we might have gotten there, Lord. Why did you stop? Could you not have come sooner and made a greater effort? Lord, I don't understand. You heard my prayer. You started out to my home with me, and you raised my hopes that you would come and lay your hand, and now she's dead. And, and they were saying, look, look, Jairus, forget about it. Why trouble us the master anymore? She's dead. Now, Christ knowing right away, and the Bible does tell us that, that as soon as he heard that, that's what the Lord says, or the Bible says, as soon as he heard that, as soon as he heard that, he immediately addressed this man's concern, and he says, be not afraid of those evil tidings, of this untimely delay that you call it. Be not afraid. Only believe. Only believe. And that's exactly the word that he got. How quickly the Lord moved to comfort this child, this servant of God. The means Christ used was his word, for he spoke to him. And as soon as he heard discouraging word, the Lord brought an encouraging word. And listen, the devil will do to you what he will. And if he discourages your heart, I'm telling you, the Lord will immediately move to encourage you. And I could write a book I'm sure that's no surprise to most. <laughs> it's the size of your sermons. You can write more than a book. I could write a book on the times when I have been discouraged. And in an instant, there comes the encouragements of God. They're like chariots out of heaven. 
sent fiery chariots as if they're going faster than the speed of light to get to God's servant, to lift his heart, to encourage his soul so that he doesn't lose heart, so he doesn't go down, so he doesn't become unbelieving and he doesn't throw the towel in and he doesn't quit and he doesn't say that's it and he doesn't slacken his pace. God sends the encouragement and it says that, it tells us that as soon as, and I like what it says, as soon as Jesus heard that. It's not what exactly what it says in verse 36. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, thy daughter's dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? As soon, as quickly as that was spoken, Jesus saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. I tell you, the Lord meets us with a word. No matter when, we're down in spirit. Are we lonely? There's a word, Isaiah 41:10. You know it well. Are we anxious? There's a word for you, 1 Peter 5, 7. You know it well. Are we struggling? There's a word for you, Philippians 4, 13. You know it well. Are we in need? There's another word from the same book, just a few verses on, verse 19. Are we in trouble? What about John 14, 1? John 14, 27. Do we need help? What about Psalm 1, 2, 1? Are we faithless? What about Lamentations 3, 22 and 23? Are we needing guidance? What about Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6? Are we fearful? And what about Psalm 46, 1 and Psalm 46, 10? Oh, oh, we could go on through the list. There's a word from God for you to encourage you in every single situation. Remember, you and I have a God who loves. He cares for us. He'll provide for us, protect us in all the ups and downs of life. Be not afraid. Only believe. Thirdly and finally, you have the deliverance that Jairus experienced. Before the Lord performed the miracle of raising his daughter from the dead, he had another work to do. And I know I could stop here and time always beats me. I know that. But I think this is important. You notice in verses 38 and 39, before the Lord did this miracle, he had a work to do. It wasn't a pleasant task, but he had to do it because the miracle could not have happened unless the Lord did this. I'd love to put this out as a Bible study and as a, like a trivia quiz and say, what great work did the Lord have to do, first of all, before he could raise this young girl from the dead? Well, you have it here in Scripture. And in verses 38 and 39, look what it says. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and seeth the tumult and them that wept and wailed greatly. These are what is known as hard mourners. Something similar to the crowd that gathered in the house in Bethany, there in John's Gospel. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And look at verse 40. And they laughed him to scorn. And again, this is in the word laughed is in the aorist tense, meaning the continuous. That is, they began to laugh and laugh and laugh him to scorn. They derided him. They ridiculed him. And they treated him with absolute disdain and disgust. And they laughed and they laughed as if they, they pretended and threw their heads back and they laughed. Did you hear him? Huh, she's not dead. Are we stupid or something? She's dead all right, sleeping. What a load of nonsense. And they laughed him to scorn. They, la they laughed him to scorn. It's remarkable. And look what it says. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and mother of the damsel and them that were with him, Peter, James, and John, and entereth in where the damsel was lying. And here's the great work he did. You see, Christ had to deal with these mockers and those that treated him with disdain. And they laughed him, they poured scorn. There could be no work of grace, no miracle done in such an atmosphere of unbelief. They laughed at his word. She's not dead. She sleeps. They laughed at the word of God. And they laughed at the one who spoke the word, Christ. Christ could not have healed that little girl and raised her from the dead in the midst of a crowd like that. And here's what he had to do. It tells us that he put them all out. He put them out. That's what the scripture says. And it's very strong. Because these words belong to physical force. That means he grabbed them. 
And by the scruff of the neck, he, he put them out of the house. We don't have the recorded words. We just have the action. He put them all out. When you look at the Greek, it's physical. So we can with license say tonight that the Lord manhandled these people in a righteous way, the same way he put all those money changers and sellers of dove that made God's house a den of thieves instead of a house of prayer. And he drove them out with a cord of, of whips and whipped them out and put them out. And that's exactly what he did. He put them out in order for the miracle to, to be performed. It could never happen with those people in the home. Laughing, mocking, deriding, and then the Lord trying to come in and work in that atmosphere. It's an impossibility. Can I say something to you? And this is not the burden of my message, but I feel it bears uh, saying because it's being recorded. People will listen, and it's not just for here, for elsewhere. You know, in churches today, in the midst of some disputes in churches, people fall out with each other, and they fall out with the minister, and they fall out with the elders, and they don't speak to them. They don't shake their hands at the door. That's nothing to do with COVID, by the way, uh, pre-COVID days. And what they do is they come into church and they just sit there and they throw their Bible, if they even bring it with them, uh, down in the side of the pew. And they, they just fold their arms like that and they're sour-faced and they're looking at the minister. They're looking across to the elders or some other member and they're sitting there and they're just angry, angry. Now, friends, I have to say this. Most churches let them sit for years. That's a fact. And they hold back the blessing of God and there's not a sinner will be raised from the dead in those meetings. And sessions do need to act on these matters and deal with them. And if necessary, put them out. Out of fellowship, out of membership and deal with them. The Lord did. And that's scriptural. And then he brought just a few in. You see, the Lord's not interested in a crowd. Just a few who, who believe, who are in unity. And with his mum and dad, the wee girl's mum and dad, Peter, James, and John, he went into that room and there was an atmosphere of harmony and unity. And therefore, I believe a great work can be done when those things are purged from the church. So remember, it's easy to fall out, but don't become bitter. Don't sit in a meeting with a sour face. Put it right with God. Get it right with your fellow believers. And I know no issue, none whatsoever. And I don't want to know of any unless it's pretty serious. But you can just put it right if there is one. Because if it's not put right, then bitterness comes in. You bring it into the church. And before you know it, you're sitting there and you're saying, well, I was here longer than they were. And I was here longer than he was. And I was longer, longer here than any of those session members. And I'll not be moving. And I'll be sitting here. And they do what they like with me. But I'll sit here. But I'm not listening to that preaching. And I'm not listening to that singing. And when I get up, I'm not going to sing. I'll sit with my head down. And I'll, I'll put my head back and even let on I'm sleeping. And people do that. Believe me. They do that. And we've seen it. And they do that. And in many ways, they do what this crowd does. They treat the Lord and his word with utter disdain. And the means of grace, they ridicule. I tell you, the Lord can never work in a house like that. So he put them out. And then he did a great work. He came to the place of the need, the home. And what a difference when the Lord steps in to any needy place. And then he spoke the word. And if the Lord only speaks the word into your situation, things will be totally different. So, Lord, speak the word. That will be sufficient. Command deliverance and that will be enough. Lord, just give me thy word tonight on this matter and I can face any difficulty and, and I can do it with trust and confidence. Well, the Lord has spoken the word to us tonight. Be not afraid, only believe. Amen. But trust the Lord will bless his word to all of our hearts. Well, God willing, this weekend we do have our Easter services on the Lord's Day morning. I seek to preach on a theme connected with the resurrection of Christ. And then in the evening we have a special testimony. Mr. Derek Preston will be coming along to share a personal word of testimony. And uh, our brother David Warwick will be uh, ministering in song. Uh, we hope to have some of our young people playing uh, some instruments or, well, uh, 
maybe a, the same instrument but two different individuals but we'll see how that goes and uh, it should go okay and we're looking to the Lord for his help and then you could pray please the, the Bible club will be on God willing uh, I think it's the uh, Friday the Saturday and the Monday so that's the second the third and the fifth isn't that right folks for the Bible club for uh, free P kids and uh, it's at 10 a.m. each morning, Friday morning, that's Good Friday, this Friday, Saturday morning, and then Monday morning. And then we have our Easter convention meetings, as we would call them. You have the Friday night, and I don't have the details with me, Jackie, but is it half seven? Oh, Saturday night, beg your pardon. Saturday night, and then uh, we have Monday night. It was on Monday afternoon last time, but it's Monday night this time. Is it half seven too, Jackie? Yes, okay. So... We've given the details and we trust that you'll be able to tune in. Uh, even if you're out and about walking, you could just take your phone, uh, you could just hold it out and put it on loudspeaker and you'll be able to uh, listen to those services. And we trust you will join with us and the Lord will richly bless. Do bless these efforts. Uh, do pray for these efforts and trust the Lord will bless them in the gospel. Uh, Brother John Highlands uh, got out of hospital this afternoon. I was speaking to him today and I, but he'd hoped to get out this afternoon and I haven't word, heard any word to change that so we're thankful to the Lord that our brother John is at home again and uh, we trust he will have a speedy recovery and our brother Brian Jackson had a fall I think it was on the road as far as I'm aware and uh, he has some paper stitches just on his nose and cheek is bruised and um, ribs, are ribs are sore and everything so <laughs> Sinus problems. I have sinus problems as well. My wife keeps sending me sinus a check, sinus another check. But uh, okay, we'll pray for Brian. We trust the Lord will be, be with him. He could be listening tonight and our brother John as well. Uh, and then there are uh, many others on the list. We want to be praying for Stephen Brown. Uh, that's um, a brother of Ruth King and brother-in-law of James, obviously. So please pray for Stephen and trust the Lord will uh, remember these individuals. You know the ones on the list, John and uh, Gemma Hamilton and their sister Sandra. Uh, sister Julie's uh, sister Sandra and also for uh, Mary Brown you pray please for Mary she's not one bit well and pray for Sandra and for Sam Sam's going for some cardiac tests and for Philip and Ken please remember these individuals in prayer John and Martha Ferguson John and El Kerr and Anne Campbell Sammy Peacock and uh, the list goes on we want to pray for George and Raymond McConnell and also for uh, what we would call Mountain George that's the clerk of session of uh, Kilkeel and he too is George McConnell and then please pray for brother Robin, Robin, Robin Hamilton as he recovers at home and our brother Sam uh, Hattrick's sister Edith Finnegan and Raymond Stevenson that's the father of uh, Vivian so please remember uh, these indivi individuals and we trust the Lord will draw near. I was asked just coming in there to uh, remind the congregation to pray for Hugh Garrett's wife. Uh, he's the clerk of session over our church in Ballygown, and I understand that his wife's not too well, and there has come a request to our church here, our neighboring church, obviously, to Ballygown, to pray for Hugh Garrett's wife. I'm not sure of her first name, but you could please remember this dear lady in prayer. Are there any other prayer requests that you'd like to leave with us? Yes, Corey. Oh, yes, I. Ah, yes, your mum. We'll do that, certainly. You can remember Corey's mum, please, in your prayers. Any other prayer requests? If not, okay, we'll, we'll get down to a season of prayer. Father, we. Pray. <laughs>